Folks, have you ever heard the expression, it takes a village? It's so true, whether it's to raise a child, for a marriage to thrive, it takes a village. And it takes a village for a Christian to grow as well. This morning, I want to really focus in on our small group relaunch uh, in a few weeks' time. And, and the message is very simple. It takes a village. You need a village. You need a tribe that you can depend on. And the heart of the message this week is that this church can be your village, can be your tribe. That place where you can turn to people whose opinions you can trust, whose insights are welcome, whose prayers are guaranteed. And I want to underline that village mentality and moving away from reliance on one person standing at the front doing all the work. That's not church. Or at least it's not enough of what church ought to be. It's too passive. And perhaps that's the real long-term damage of COVID in the church across Northern Ireland and the Western world, is that it's made so many Christians passive. That mental fatigue, that lack of sharpness. And what I want to do as we relaunch our small groups is to make your faith an active faith, not passive, but rather really build on this idea we're stronger, we're better together. Creating a culture of being able to come together with a mind to support one another and to encourage one another and to pray for one another. That's the goal. Because to get through life, it takes a village. And we're better together. And I want to start with why this shift is important for us right now. It's felt like so much of church since COVID has been just me standing at the front preaching. And that is desperately insufficient for like 13 reasons I can think of just straight off the back, okay? And we'll get into that a little bit about why. But first, let me underline why I'm still worth employing, you know, before you all decide, actually, you know what, he is worthless, let's get rid. First of all, it's vital that you understand that in the life of the church, preaching is an essential, integral part of God's purpose. Singing is good and it's part of it. But one of the greatest things that we do when we come together is we gather around God's word because it's when God speaks to us. <clears throat> Singing is wonderful. It thrills our hearts. It's moving, it's emotional, and it prepares us as we speak to God, as we endeavor to, to say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, transform me. But that is so that when we come to the word, we hear him speak, that we will be transformed, that we will be changed, that we will be renewed. So not only do I love what I do, I believe in what I do. First Timothy says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be competent and equipped for every good work. I charge in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. And he goes on to say, in the season, out of season, keep preaching the word. Paul's talking to Timothy and the context is Timothy's pastoring in the church of Ephesus and he's struggling. He's finding it hard. People are talking down to him because of his age and he's struggling to kind of really get in with the people who've got influence and power and status and he's struggling to break it through. And the message is when times are going tough, when you don't know what to do, preach the word. And all of chapter 3, building up to those words, it's talking about the benefits of Scripture and the usefulness of Scripture. And then he says, so I charge you in the presence of God. Preach that word. And so that lands on me and my role as the teacher in the church. With My job is to preach the word. But the Bible is also very clear that that is not the only job that exists in the church. Preaching alone is not enough to define what the church ought to be because you have your jobs as well. 
my job's handy because it's full time and it's employed and so it's very much written out in a contract of employment. I know what my job is. But do you know what your job is here in the church? It takes a village. Let me give you a couple of reasons why it's important that you play your part. And even my small groups is a perfect place to do that. First of all, all members are ministers. Ephesians 4 says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. <coughs> Look carefully at that. He says, God has put people into the church, okay, church leaders, and their job as a leadership is to not go and do all the work. The job of the leadership is not to build up the body. Rather, the job is to give you, the saints, the tools to do that work. Right? He has given shepherds and teachers, okay, great, to what end? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work. To equip the saints for the work. And what is that work? The building up of the body. And maybe we failed as this because of COVID. We've become passive and, and we just got used to sitting in our pajamas with a cup of coffee and watching a YouTube video of a sermon. And then we just switch over and we go to something else and that was us doing church. It's not church. Not church. Preaching the sermon is part of the equipping, but it's not the work. <clears throat> it is coming under the sound of the word of God and then responding to it. That is the work. To build up the body by making it grow wider, by bringing new people in and, and reaching out with the gospel, but also making it grow downwards, deeper, firmer by maturing and becoming stronger rooted in the things of God the work is the one anothering put out in scripture the work is soul winning the work is discipleship and so that's the first reason why I am woefully insufficient for you to thrive spiritually because I'm not enough for what the church needs I can only do my job we need you to do yours because all members are ministers. We all have a job to do in building up the body. Second reason that I have is that the Holy Spirit ministers to the body through each member. Or at least the Spirit wants to minister through every person. So if it's only me and my sermon, everyone's missing out. Everyone. 1 Corinthians 12, and this is probably one of the most important verses in this kind of series of chapters, chapters 12, 13, 14, when he's talking about the, the spiritual gifts uh, and all the different things, you know, when he's talking about tongues and healing and all the rest of it. I think this is one of the most important verses. Listen to it carefully. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To each is given out. I spent a lot of time this week going into some very deep uh, research, checking all the Greek and all the different meanings of all this of the word each. And it turns out that there's something really interesting here, okay? Turns out that word each means each. True story. As in everyone who believes, each and every one who believes. So if you believe in Christ, if you're trusting in Christ, then it's you as well. Each. He's right, because if you are in Christ, if you are attached to Jesus, and therefore by default attached to the church by the Spirit of God, every single one of us has Christ in us, the Spirit of God in us, and it should show. That's what it says. There should be a reflection of Christ in us that people can see. Because that's what the word manifest means. It, it means it's something that is demonstrably evident. Something that you can point to, look at and see. It is manifest. 
So in the believer, the Spirit of God is becoming manifest. God is revealing himself in how we live, in how we talk, in how we think. And people should start to see that. And it should benefit the people around you. Because if each and every one of us is a wee bit more like Christ than we were last week, a wee bit more like Christ than we were the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that, all of a sudden I'm looking around and I'm seeing Christ reflected here, and 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 all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I like being here, because I'm getting all these people who are reflecting Christ into my life, and that's exciting, and that's good, and I like being here, because it's good. So don't get that anywhere else. You're not going to get that where you work. You're not going to get that where you study. But you get it here. So whenever I meet with my small group, I'm meeting people that by just being who they are, they are a blessing. And there's this common good of just meeting with Christ-like people around you. And it's good for the church because all of a sudden it just doesn't fall on the same handful of people shining for Jesus. The same handful of people who end up having to take on all the responsibility or take on all the workload. But all of a sudden you have a body of believers shining for Jesus, reflecting God and doing it in a way that spurs one another on, that encourages one another to keep going and to join in and will encourage those whose light has dimmed or faded because of sin or apathy or hurt. Over the summer, we were able to enjoy a couple of barbecues as a family. Um, I prefer charcoal over gas. I like the smell. I like the taste um, that it gives. I know that's not necessarily a popular opinion. That's where I am, okay? Pray for me. But the thing is, you take one of those white hot coals. You take the hottest one that's there. And it doesn't matter how hot it's burning. You set it by itself, it will cool down very quickly. But when you keep it in with others that are hot, they sustain one another and they burn longer and brighter together. That's the point of small group. You might be doing fine as a believer without it. You might say, Jeff, listen, the last year or two, I've done fine. I don't need other people. But listen, you might have grown cold without realizing it. You might not be where you once were. You might not even really notice it yet. But when you come together and you're actively talking about the things of God and praying and reflecting and sharing and even just having a cup of tea with people and you're talking, there is a way that we keep each other warm and on fire for God that you simply cannot do by yourself. Because loneliness isn't good for the soul. Even in a perfect world, God looked at him and says, it's not good for you to be alone. It's not good. The truth is, sometimes we miss it. I know in my life, there's times whenever I don't see it. And it's only whenever I get into the presence of other Christians and other people, and you kind of went, oh, they're, they're doing all that. Oh, okay, right, well, I need to, I've maybe stopped doing that. I've maybe drifted here off course very slowly. It's a lot easier to get caught up again or get back on track whenever it's a small course correction. Think of it this way. Sunday mornings is when I come and I shine the light of the word. Okay, his word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Sunday mornings are about light in the darkness. But small groups where you get the warmth. Small groups where, where, you, where you get that heat and that, that togetherness that, and that joy in encouraging one another and being encouraged. Light and warmth. Third reason why I'm insufficient is that not only are everyone ministers, not only is every minister, every member equipped with the manifestation of the Spirit, I'd argue that that very manifestation makes you indispensable. 
Two verses from 1 Corinthians 12 will help us here. I'm going to do them in reverse order because Paul has this habit of saying, well, if this is true and this is true, therefore this must be true. Okay, and he kind of builds his argument and then conclusion. I want to start with the conclusion and work backwards. Verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now, if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, and I would encourage you to, to make notes in your Bible if you can, underline that word indispensable. We all know somebody whose life is maybe a wee bit tough, Maybe there is a learning difficulty there. Maybe there is just life's been a little bit dysfunctional and it's made them a little bit dysfunctional as a result. Maybe they're quirky. Maybe just life has taken them in a way that is, makes you hard to relate to them. Maybe they're the type of person where other clubs and societies wouldn't want them. They're not gonna get into the golf club. They're not going to get into the bowling club. They're not going to get into the whatever club. Because, hey, they'll not really contribute. They'll bring the standard down. They wouldn't really be a right fit for our group. God says to his church, these people are indispensable. I love the strength of that word. It's not a case of saying, thou shalt tolerate them. Give them a sippy cup and put them in the corner, they'll be fine. No. No, no. Make room for them because it's the right thing to do. No. It's very clearly the opposite. Understand that even the weakest believer is indispensable to the life of the church. Like the shepherd who, who realizes that 99 of his 100 sheep are okay. That's too many to lose. So he drops everything he has and he goes and he searches through the storm, through the night, to find the one sheep that was lost. Why? Because even one sheep is crucial, vital, important. Amen. And that maybe someone comes along to church, maybe it's you, and you think, I can't really serve, I can't play an instrument, I can't talk in front of people, I don't really like doing youth stuff, I have nothing to give, I'm worthless. Christ says, no, you are absolutely crucial to what I'm doing. And like maybe, you know, I've been in small groups before, and there's been a temptation sometimes to think, you know, and you know you shouldn't think this, but sometimes you think, you know, maybe the group would work better tonight if they didn't show up. I can't see another way of applying this text other than saying those that seem weak, those that might cause difficulties or awkwardness, they are indispensable to the church. Scripture is very clear. Even the most immature Christian, even the quirkiest personality, they are important to the body of the church. Sorry, no, not important. Indispensable. Indispensable. Maybe you need to say that to yourself right now. I'm indispensable. I, I have been bought at a great price. I have worth. I have something to offer. I'm indispensable. something to offer and I'd say to you then okay let's offer it then let's get around to that let's offer it now you have something to offer let's offer it think about the people in our own church there, there's people who have autism people with Tourette's <coughs> maybe at some point there'll be someone who has an eating disorder and it's not easy They're a gift, not a burden. Each and every child has worth. Each and every child has value. And for all the questions and tests and trials and suffering, that child, those families, each give us an opportunity to allow the Spirit of God to manifest itself in us. 
It's an opportunity to let the, the body grow for the common good. We could add to that list. What about the cancer patient? Or the Alzheimer's patient? Or the person who's so depressed they can't get out of bed? The parts of the body that seem weaker to us are absolutely indispensable. That's why I want to start with verse 22. Let's go back to verse 21 and look at the argument that Paul makes to get to that conclusion. He says that I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. You don't get to think that some Christians are more important than others. Imagine someone says, well, I don't belong here. And then someone else turns around and goes, yeah, you don't really belong here. Could you imagine the church of Jesus Christ acting as well? An eye, I'm an eye, you're a foot. I got nothing I can learn from you. You've got nothing that you could teach me. Imagine that kind of an attitude, that kind of pride. And this is the point of the text, highlighting two very different attitudes, both that are wrong. Whether you're denying the manifestation of the Spirit in your own life, or whether you're denying the manifestation of the Spirit in someone else's life, you don't get away with doing that in the church. Everyone has a part to play, and it takes a village. The ministry of the saints, each one has the Spirit of God. You are indispensable. No one should talk like they are not. And simultaneously, no one should talk like only they are indispensable. And by the way, if you have a group of hand-picked people who are your friends, who are people that you like, you don't have a small group. You have a clique. And they're very dangerous in churches. If someone isn't welcome to join you, what you're saying is, well, you're different than us. I have no need of you. The Bible says, no, that's not how we talk. That's not how we get on. That's not how we treat one another here in ABC. Fourth reason for the need in this shift in ministry is that the word is commanded from all members to all members. It takes a village. You have to share the word with one another. I'm not saying you need to sort of start saying, okay, you know, everyone that's turned to, to in your in our Bibles now to no, but simply just a wee quote or just a wee insight. It means a lot. Rather than waiting for me or one of the elders to do it, you can do it. Hebrews three. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day. As long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. It's a tricky thing. It's a sly customer. It can work very cleverly in our lives. So we need people close to us to be watchful. And so that's why we have a small group, because we can start paying attention. Because sometimes even in ourselves, we don't notice ourselves growing cold. We don't notice ourselves drifting away from God. Oh, well, you know, I'm not at the prayer meeting like I used to be, but hey, I'm still there every Sunday. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, I'm there three out of four. And then it's like, well, I'm there two out of four. I'm there every other week. You slowly drift. <coughs> And the one anothering that happens in small group is a natural function of the group. And I'm arguing here that the exhortations and the encouragements are biblical ones. I'm assuming that they're going to be biblical ones, not just cliches of empty words or phrases or things, just theology that you made up in your own head. Well, I don't think that God would want that. I don't think God knows how no, the Bible says. Here's what God wants. The Bible says, God says this. Because it is profitable for teaching and repute and reproof and correction and training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. 
And what is that good work Ephesians for? For the building up of the body. And the more of the word that you know, and the more of the word of God that is being poured into your life by other people, the powerful and stronger you'll be as a group. Hebrews 10. Let's consider how to stir one another up. To love and to good works. Not neglecting to be together as the habit is of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Honest, honest question. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Is this part of your Christian life? Or is this something that you're doing on the regular? Or are you sinning by neglecting this? When do you, do you encourage? When do you stir people up to good works? Doesn't naturally or easily happen on Sunday mornings. But it can come naturally in small groups. Now for years, this verse has just been used to bang people over the heads and say, get to church. Sit there, shut up, and listen to the sermon, and then get it. You know? Don't neglect the assembling of yourself. Just get yourself to church. And look, there, there, there's, there's benefits in, in being regular and faithful to church. Of course there is. But the context of this is being together. The context of this is that you might be encouraged by one another, that you can build each other up, that you can say to someone and bless someone and pray for someone and encourage someone and lift them up. Someone who's maybe not had another Christian to talk to all week. When do you do that? I was clear, yes, keep coming. Keep making space in your calendar to be there. But it's not just to hear someone talk at the front. It is that you might encourage and be encouraged with. That the body may be built up. Last point, okay. Experience tells us that one another, whether it's praying for one another, or considering how to stir one another up to good works, it is a necessary partner with preaching. Warmth and light. Now I've jotted down a couple of bullet points here to emphasize this and how I phrase them is to sort of say, look, these are some of the problems that small groups fix. And if we don't have small groups, these will be problems that will exist and persist in our church. Okay? That's how I, I've been thinking about it in my head. Number one, there's an impulse to hide in a crowd. To slip in and to slip out. And maybe there's so many Christians down through the years, down through generations, been more than happy for that to be their experience of church. They arrive just after the service starts. They kind of get out before the last amen has been said. And that's church. Now maybe they genuinely worshiped while they were here. Maybe they genuinely were listening to what was being said at the time. But ultimately, People like that don't want it to be about them. And look, it's so easy to do church that way. Whenever I was off, I did church that way. You drop into another church uh, and you kind of sit, you listen, and you're out. And you don't think about the people that you were sitting with. You don't think about the one, you know, you just don't tune in. You know, you kind of move on. You'll see you next year. That's not being part of the church. so easy to get into this mindset especially when you spend so long watching church online where you watch the message and then you flip over to i'm a celebrity and you just don't break sweat you maybe just stick the kettle on in between but you just move from one into the other and nothing changes we need to change that mindset where church is not something that you watch Church is not something that you attend. Church is something that we are. Number two, we can get into the habit of passive listening. See, there's times whenever being a preacher can be really discouraging. 
you bust the gut all week, you preach your heart out, and then you get to the door and somebody says, I oh, you know, I've been thinking about this. And what they say then is the complete opposite to everything that you just said previously. <laughs> like, what are you listening? Did, did you even pay any attention to what was going on, really, to, to what I just said? Let me give an example from another church, a true example. A couple who had been attending a large church for about three years. Now, they weren't members or anything like that there, but they'd been going regularly for three years. And they had a baby, and they wanted to get the baby uh, dedicated. Brilliant. No problem. The church was uh, excited to do that. And so in the weeks running up to the service, the pastor called out to try and get uh, a feel for him. He didn't really know them all that well because the church was so big. And so he gets out and he starts talking to him, and suddenly he realizes that this couple are unmarried. And have been more than happy to be uh, living in sin throughout the, the relationship and through the time that they've been involved in the church. And yet they were totally okay with it. They saw no problem with what was happening. And the pastor had to try and explain that this doesn't work. You can't live in sin and testify to be Christians. It doesn't work. And he couldn't believe that despite many a time having preached on the subject and having addressed the subject and on a call to holy living, that they had sat through it all and thought, yeah, those people out there, they really need to listen to us. And yet they just continued to live on in their own sin. They didn't want to change. You know, we've done sermons on prayer, prayer series. People go past Jeff, that was brilliant, really encouraging, really encouraging. Prayer lives haven't changed. Passive listening. Everyone else needs to change except me. Small groups make that harder because all of a sudden there's less people to look around and we're talking about, well, how do we make this real? How do, how do we actually live this out? How do we apply this in our lives? And you're like, oh, we have to apply this to our lives? Bit radical, but okay, let, let's hear it out. Number three, it's easy to fake it on a Sunday morning. By that I mean you could be arguing with your wife as you come up the road, you turn into the car park. <clears throat> Happy families, smiling, smiling, don't let anyone know that we had the mother of all fights on our way out. We walk in, we sing our songs, we listen to the sermon, we talk to our friends separately, we get into the car, get out of the drive, see you. I mean, I tell you, if you, right? And we just get right back into it. And the, and the, hour, the hour and a half that we just spent in church was absolute fake. Now, I'm not saying you're bringing fights into church, all right? or that it's wrong to not share everything. Of course not. N nobody is expected to come in and say, we do you hear what she did? We do you hear what he did? Right, right. We understand that. But small groups is a place where we can talk about the times whenever we know that what we believe and how we live don't always match up. <coughs> Sometimes you'll come and you'll just want to listen because you're not ready to share. You're not ready to let go of the anger or the bitterness or stubbornness or whatever yet. That's okay. But small groups is a place when we get to talk about those things. Where it's okay to talk about how sometimes it's hard to be a Christian. Maybe it's because the temper seems to be short despite being saved for five years, 10 years, 20 years. And that fuse, for some reason, doesn't seem to be getting any longer. Or why, why is it that Sunday mornings is more likely when you're going to fight about trying to get out of the house for 10.30? Whenever you can do it on Mondays at 8 a.m., no problem. Maybe somebody else shares. And you're like, you know what? I was there. I know what that's like. 
I mean, let's just say how I find it. My coping mechanisms. How I got around that. And all of a sudden, there's an opportunity to pray together. And actually, all of a sudden, now there's a bit of accountability and saying, well, look, listen, how'd you get on this week? We were talking about this two weeks ago. How did you find it this week? Did you find those same triggers affecting you the same way? Because we were praying for you. Maybe it's the boss who pushes your buttons. Maybe it's the kids who push your buttons. Or your husband that pushes your buttons. Or your wife that pushes your buttons. Or the in-laws that push your buttons. Or whatever it happens to be that pushes your buttons. And it hangs over you sometimes like a storm. You can fake it for an hour on a Sunday. Pretend that you're just a wonderful Christian who soars through life. Small groups give you a chance to admit, sometimes I need help. Yes, even me. Now, I'm not being glib when I say that. But I mean all of us saying, yeah, even I need help. Have you ever noticed that we tend to hold on to our own mistakes a lot more than other people do? If I ask you to think about one or two of the most embarrassing moments in your life, you'll probably have about five that you're going through your head and you go, how do I filter this down to the one or two, right? Then if I were to ask you to call out uh, someone else in the church, their most embarrassing moments, you might find it harder to remember. You say, I don't really remember them doing anything daft. I remember the time I did daft stuff or I did something stupid. I don't remember... Because we have a way of holding on to our own stuff a whole lot more. And yet, we know that nobody's perfect. We know that everybody is saved by grace. We know that everybody is a work in progress. And yet, so often as Christians, we hold on to this idea of, yeah, but I still have to be perfect. I know nobody's perfect. I don't expect other people to be perfect. But I still have to hold on and be that. Because maybe we're living in this goldfish at home when our husbands or our wives or our kids aren't saved. Or... or People in work, they're not saved, or people in school aren't saved. And it's like as soon as we make one mistake, like, oh, I thought you were a Christian. I didn't know Jesus. People did stuff like that. And they're like, oh, here we go. And there's this pressure to always be perfect. Or maybe you just put it on yourselves. Where, where any time there's one mistake, you, you're just haunted by guilt and shame and accusations from the devil. Because that's what he does. He's the accuser. And, we, and so we put ourselves on this pedestal that we're just going to knock ourselves down from because we're always trying to be perfect. And it's sad because there's always this constant battle in our lives to remember that it's not about our performance, but about grace. And there's this fight in our hearts every day to remember that it is about what Christ has done for us. I'm not trusting in my performance to be saved or to stay saved, but in what Christ has done and he saves and he keeps and he holds us secure. So small group is a place to work that stuff out. They say it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to be a work in progress. It's okay to still be growing because, hey, guess what? Everyone else is still growing as well. Let's grow together. And to maybe ask the question, guys, how do you find space to make your quiet times work? How, how, do you, how do you get to a place where it doesn't feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? Now, moment of honesty. I know I'm not the best pastor. I know I'm not the best preacher. I'm just going to give you a minute just to pick your jaws up off the floor. I am fully aware of my flaws. And I know that depending on the attitude with which you've come into church, what you get out of a Sunday service, your, your mileage might vary. I know that some of you will go home today and you'll have roast pasta for dinner and carve me up. But here's the thing. Knowing that I have room still to grow allows me to grow. Right? If 
I think that I've made it, if I think that I ha have learned all that I can learn and can do all that I can do, if I carry that illusion or that delusion that I've made it, it doesn't give me any room. It certainly doesn't give me any desire to grow because I refuse to admit that there's anything that needs to change. Don't fake it. That's my point. Get around people who you can let your guard down with and share and grow together. And the last one, don't miss your turn. One of the big concerns about your church experience is just sitting and listening and that's it. If that's church, you're not doing church right. Okay? See, when church was online, I said at the AGM, I hated that version of church. Because I wasn't getting anything from any, anyone else. You know, I, when you're meeting here and you're chatting and you're talking to people, you start to feel like you're part of it. But whenever this was my work experience, my church experience, my, it was just like, oh, I felt so cut off. I felt so isolated. And I was just like, oh. And look, I, I feel sorry for you if that's been your experience even still. We've been back and you still haven't really gotten the habit of being out regularly and interacting with people. Any wonder your Christian life feels flat because you can't live off me or my sermons. So how do you take your turn? Well, I mean... I know whenever I'm up here preaching, you can't necessarily say, hold on, Jeff, shh, 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 right, stop. Could you repeat that a wee bit? Uh, I don't know. Could you go back a couple of minutes there and just repeat what you it, it doesn't work like that. It's not really the format for this. But small groups gives you the opportunity to ask those questions. Because we'll be talking about the Sunday morning material. In small group, you will hear other people give their opinions and say, I didn't even get that out of it. I remember taking this away from the sermon. I remember this quote that he said, this, this one line that he said, or this picture or this story that he said. And then when someone else turns around and goes, I don't even remember that being mentioned. And so all of a sudden you're being reminded of little things and the sermon becomes more valuable to you than it was on the first time of hearing it because you're getting blessed and other people are speaking into it and other people are taking turns. 1 Corinthians 14 in the Message Bible it says, here's what I want you to do. When you gather for worship, each one of you be prepared with something that will be useful for all. Sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide an insight. If prayers are offered in tongues, two or three is the limit. And then only if someone is present, you can interpret what you're saying. Otherwise, keep it between yourselves and God. No more than two or three speakers at a meeting with the rest of you listening and taking it to heart. Take your turn. No one person taking over, then each speaker gets a chance to say something special from God and you all <clears throat> learn from each other. Isn't that wonderful? We all get a chance to learn. Can you all take your turn? The only place that happens is in small group, where the format lends itself to, no, not here when it's one guy microphoned up. If you only come on a Sunday, and some of you are already here on a Sunday, you're not here at the prayer meeting, you're not involved in volunteering, let me ask you this, when are you taking your turn? When is it your turn? Right? I mean, the kids in our house all summer, it's my turn, it's my turn, it's my turn, you've had your turn, you've had your turn, right? Taking turns has been very much a strong theme in our house, okay? So let me ask you a question, well, when are you going to have your turn? Because as part of the body, I need you to be a blessing to me. I'm looking to you to, to bless because I'm missing out. Everyone's missing out until you take your turn. Why? Because you're indispensable. There's a manifestation of the Spirit in your life. So please, take your turn. Because each one of us is indispensable. We have a calling to build up the church. Christ died for you. He has a plan for you. He has given you gifts. The Spirit of God dwells within you. Let God manifest himself in you. Be the blessing that God has called you to be. And get alongside people who love him. Romans 15 says, Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us. Asking ourselves, how can I help? 
I cannot have pork night. A simple command. Let's open it. We're going to pray and then we're going to bring the musicians up to for a song. Father in heaven, we, we are stronger together. Lord, we thank you that you have not made us uh, individuals in and of ourselves, but rather you save us individually and then you plug us in to be part of the body. That you've designed us to work together, to be uh, complete only when we are together. And so, Lord, I pray that as we in, embark on this new season of small groups, Lord, that those who feel like they have drifted, for those who are maybe only realizing that they've started to get cold, Lord, that we would come back together stronger, <coughs> hotter than ever. Lord, that we'd be a blessing one to the other. That we'd be an encouragement one to the other. Lord, that as we reflect you to each other, Lord, that we and ourselves then become more like you. And we pray, Lord, that our church grows and is built up. Yes, with new people coming, but Lord, by growing deeper into the things of God. And so, Lord, we, we commit this church to you. Lord, we commit the small groups to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will use them for your glory and for your kingdom. 